Guys, uh, it's uh, what they call Passion Week in the build-up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And uh, passion is a good word that would describe all that was taking place at this particular time. There were some people who were passionate about the wrong things, the scribes and the Pharisees. There were some people who were passionate about the right things. And obviously Jesus, in his journey towards the cross, expresses unbelievable passion to fulfill that which God had called him to do. It wasn't an accident that Jesus hung upon the cross. It wasn't because, oh gosh, something went wrong in God's plan for Jesus. This was the plan and the purpose for Jesus all along. So Jesus is on a journey very passionately towards that which he had been called to do. I want to take you to a great story today. If you have your Bible, or I think it will come up on the screen. Mark chapter 14, I want to read to you about a very, very passionate woman, a woman who did something that in the eyes of people would be exceptional, but in her eyes was pretty ordinary. I hope you get the gist of what I want to talk about. Okay, let's read it. I want to read uh, Mark chapter 14. Now the Passover... And the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Man, they were a bunch of scoundrels, weren't they? They were sly. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table of the home of a man known as Simon the leper, probably somebody Jesus had healed, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the per perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why? why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing. Remember that word, beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. Remember that phrase. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then the villain in the story. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Great passage, great story, full of everything that makes a great story. There's, there's intrigue, there's villains, there's the, the, the plot behind the whole thing. This story encapsulates pretty much everything that makes a good story. But to most people, this would be a story of extravagant sacrifice. It's an apparent, apparent extravagance that a woman would take a year's wages. In that case, it would have been about 300 denarii and bought this perfume and poured it all over Jesus, broke the bottle. It was a total sacrifice. And for many people, it would have been considered to be an extravagant one. And I have preached that before about the extravagant sacrifice of this lady. But now I'm beginning to rethink some of the things that I said. We look at it as extravagant. She looked at it as normal. You see, when you love what you're sacrificed for, there is no sacrifice it's something that you do because you love to do it. And this sacrifice was nothing. If Mary was able, this was Mary, the one who sat at Jesus' feet when he was, Martha was in the kitchen. This is the same Mary who's now at Jesus' feet yet again. She loves it at Jesus' feet, listening and worshiping Jesus. And if you were to say to Mary today, Mary, wow, man, what an impressive sacrifice. What an extravagant sacrifice. She would have said, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. When you love somebody or something as much as I love Jesus, no sacrifice is extravagant. It's just totally normal to sacrifice like that. And so I want to speak into this today 
And in order for us to do that, we've got to have a certain understanding. First understanding I need you to have is that nobody forced her to make this sacrifice. This was not a sacrifice of obedience. She wasn't obeying a particular law or an injunction or being told to do this sacrifice. Secondly, it was a sacrifice of understanding. You see, you will only sacrifice to the measure that you understand. And she understood, for goodness sake, who this man was. She had seen him raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. She had seen him as he had healed the sick and heard about him as he had been, they spoke about him walking on water. She was probably there when he fed the 5,000 and she would have stood in the crowd and said, man, this really is him. This really is the Messiah, the sent one of God. This is who he is. She understood that truth full well. When you understand that truth full well, you'll be willing to make sacrifices just like this. It could trash your entire life if you really understood, really, not just in your head, not just some academic assent to some religious facts, but when you really understand when you really understand who Jesus is, no sacrifice will be extravagant. It'll just be normal. Now, in this particular passage, the question that I want to raise out of this passage is simply the question, how much is Jesus worth to you? You see, everything has a value in our lives. Our family has a value. Our jobs have a value. Our hobbies have a value. Our possessions have a value. And as much as they all have value, so too, and I say with reverence, should Jesus. Jesus, and I want to ask you today, how valuable is he to you? For her, for Mary, he was everything. No sacrifice was too big. Ask for, you don't even have to ask for I'm going to give it to you anyway, because that's the nature of this boldness in this woman. She broke all the rules. She broke the rules of protocol when she came to the room. Because a woman would never walk into a man's into the presence of a group of men. Broke the rule of prevailing wisdom that the majority say this, and therefore you must conform to the norms and the standards of the majority. She broke that rule. She shattered it. She was not in the least bit concerned with what anybody said or the protocols or the culture or the climate. She was not concerned. She just wanted to do what Jesus wanted her to do. And that sometimes is a test of our love for him. But what I find intriguing here, first of all, is that this faithfulness or this depth of worship that we see in Mary is found sometimes in the most unusual of places. If Peter, the one who had walked with Jesus on water, the one who had been with Jesus for those three years of listening to his teaching and, and hearing him, responding to his call and following him through thick and thin. If Peter had taken that jar of oil or something, you know, proportional and poured it onto Jesus and sacrificed it totally, I would say that's normal because he understood who Jesus was. But this was not Peter. If this was John that made that great sacrifice, the one who, who is regarded as being Jesus' closest friend, if this was John that made that incredible sacrifice, it would not be extravagant. It would have been normal. But I would have thought, hey, John, this is what I would expect from you simply because you know who he is. You've had intimate conversations with him. And we have the conversations that are recorded in Scripture. Can you imagine how many conversations that Peter, James, and John must have had with Jesus in private? They would have blown them away. But they're not written for us. They're not on record for us. All we have is this. And this is enough for us to understand that Jesus is who he says he is. Do you understand that? Have you got it? Because until you really grasp this truth, your level of worship will be determined by the level of your understanding of who Jesus is. And everything that Jesus wants you to do will now become a sacrifice. That's not what this passage teaches. But then we find that they're always in a passage like this, there are the critics. The comments from the critics. Judas led the way here. Judas, the one who was a disciple of Jesus, he, he leads the way. And I guess underlying the questions of Judas would be, is Jesus really worth this? Is Jesus really worth this pouring of all this one year's of salary all over him? Isn't that a bit of a waste? Couldn't we? Is, is Jesus really, really worth that? 
You see, he had a low value system. He had a low vision or a low, a low understanding of who Jesus was. That's why when Judas went and betrayed Jesus, he, he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, which was nothing compared to what Mary had poured all over Jesus. But for him, that was the value of Jesus. To him, Jesus was valued at 30 pieces of silver, and I'm happy with my 30 pieces of silver until I understood who he was. And when, Je when Judas saw that Jesus was who he said he was, even though he had heard him teach and preach, his mind was blinded, his eyes were closed, and he, when he suddenly realized, man, I've been ripped off. This is the Son of God, and I have traded him for 30 pieces of silver. Man, I have been ripped off. And look at that for an example. Isn't that true of people today? They will sell Jesus out for a career or a fast car or an or a illicit relationship. They'll sell Jesus out for a whole bunch of stuff. And when they get there in their life and they realize, as Judas said, man, I sold him out. I sold him out. I knew him, but I sold him out for a cheap thrill. Just like Esau did when he sold his birthright to Jacob. He sold his entire birthright for a pot of poiki. Now, if it's my poiki, I could understand that. No. But uh, the, the, this, he sold his entire birthright for a stew. And I'm thinking, what a waste. Only at the end did he realize what he had done. He sold his birthright for something that was of very little worth. And only at the end did he understand what he had done. Good time to stop and evaluate our own standing, don't you think? What's of worth to you? Jesus should be of our absolute worth to you. I was intrigued this morning in the classic service that there were three, there were more than that, new faces, but there were three new faces that came in and drenched with water. They had walked miles to come to church. And this was their first service. And they walked in with faces beaming, can't wait to get to church. We've heard about the church. We want to come to church. And there they are having walked for miles from Millwood. One guy came down from Harding to come to church today. No sacrifice, yeah? <laughs> How can you be a sacrifice? But I want to do this. I can't wait. And I find that so humbling in the context of a world in which we live where we drive cars. Can I go to church today? Oh, no, it's raining. We just stay home and watch on TV. I don't know, you know? But I just was, I, I looked at these three people and two of them sat in the front row, one sat at the back, and I thought, man, I love those people. And God applauds them, not because they made a sacrifice, but because they did it, because they wanted to do it. There was no sacrifice involved over here. But the comments from the critics are saying, how much is Jesus worth? For them, Jesus was worth a walk in the rain. How much devotion is too much to Jesus? We think, can't you calm down a little bit, Trevor? Why do you have to be so radical, Trevor? You know, well, I'm going to tell you, if this woman is a, is a picture for us, she set the bar really high on the level of the subject of radical faith in Christ and radical worship for the Jesus who she loved so much. It wasn't extravagant, but it was sure worth, worth it at the end. Let me tell you, it's only extravagant if it's not worth it. Think about that for a moment. The apparent extravagance is justified by the outcome or the heart that she had toward Jesus. Who is he or who he is to you will determine his worth to you and it will also determine the depth of your worship. Who is he to you? You can measure the depth of your worship by answering that question. Who is he to you? Is he just somebody that you know about, somebody you've heard about, somebody you believe in? That's really good. It's a good starting point. But if that's all you've got, then you've, you're going to miss the point completely, and your Christian life is going to be stereotypical and bland and, and mundane. But when you really get to know Him in that journey where you never really get to know Him until you get to eternity one day, but right down on earth, that's the journey that we are in for. 
If your worship is, super spir- is superficial and, and convenient, that reflects the extent and the worth and the value of who Jesus is to you. That's a tough statement. Some people won't like that. That's okay. Jesus' response, I love this. Leave her alone, he says to these men. Leave her alone. And I'm sure if we were to be colloquial about this thing, and I've used this illustration before, that I'm sure Jesus probably could have said, you know what, guys, you might be right, hey? You could have used this money for a better cause. You could have fed the poor. There could have been, this was not the best way to do it. it was, there could be a better way. There, could be the, there might have been a best way. But, but guys, don't you think what it was beautiful, what she did? And beautiful acts of worship towards God that are sacrificial and break the rules sometimes are the beautiful aspects of the worship of God are better than the best and the better. Beauty trumps those two hands down. And Jesus said, oh, it might be better. It could have been better. Well, probably not the best. But man, that was the best because it was beautiful. Now, we ask the question here at... Uh, at why should we why should we even contemplate making so great a sacrifice in inverted commas the first thing is because he's worth it he's worth it if he is who he is he's worth every sacrifice that you will have to make and you will turn sacrifice into normality if he's worth it that's the first thing the second thing is an intriguing one and the, why should we love him like that? It's simply because he loves us like that. You see, Jesus sees worth in us. He sees us as being totally worthy of his sacrifice. Jesus sees what he did on the cross as normal. He wasn't extravagant to Jesus. This was a normal sacrifice because I love you the way that I do. This is normal for me to do these things on your behalf. It's totally normal. Can you imagine on the day, and I'm just using my imagination, Jesus leaves heaven to come down to earth, and the angels are standing there, and they all say, so Jesus, Jesus, where are you going? And Jesus said, no, I'm getting out of planet earth. They're in trouble. I need to help them. And the angels would have looked down on planet earth and said, (laughs) Jesus, look at them. They're fighting each other. They're not trusting you. In fact, Jesus, it looks like they pretty much hate you. They've got no time for you, Jesus. Jesus, are those people down there on planet Earth really worth it? Are you really going to go through what you say you're going to go through in the plan of God? Are they really worth it? And Jesus would have smiled and said, hmm, absolutely they are. You know why? That's why terminology in the Bible is so important. Jesus often refers to, and Paul refers to us, as the bride of Christ. You men... We make sacrifices for the woman that we love. The movies are made up about this. Knights in shining armor going after Maid Marian. And Dula. They will willingly lay down their lives for the one that they love. Isn't that not what Jesus did? He blew the protocols. He blew the probably wisdom of the day. And Jesus said, they're not really worth it. Jesus just snuffed them out and started again. Jesus didn't do that. Because you and I are worthy of his sacrifice. I didn't say we're nice people. In fact, in the main, we're not very nice. In the main, we're messed up. We're sinful. And yet Jesus sees unbelievable worth in you. That his supposed sacrifice on our behalf was total normality for him. Because he sees worth in, in you. A disciple is someone who sees and responds to the worth of Christ. The depth of your discipleship will be determined by the depth of your understanding of the worth of Jesus. Please get this, people. Paul in Philippians 3, verse 7 and 8, is sharing with the people there his credentials. He's talking about how well-educated he has been. He talks about how he's been persecuted so badly. And he's had stripes. He's been in prison more times than you could count. But he has the credentials to show it. And they say, wow, Paul, that's impressive stuff. And Paul said, nah, it's not impressive at all. He said, I would let, 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 that stuff is like dung, he says, if you want to be colloquial. That stuff is like rubbish to me compared to knowing Jesus and who he is. I didn't even talk about that stuff. I'm not even interested in that stuff. Because all I want is Jesus. 
None of that counts. None of it counts as long as you get Jesus. And the length to which you will go will be to the ends of the earth and around hell through wherever you have to go in order to get Jesus. But there's a problem. The problem is here is it relates to glory. You see, Jesus will not share his glory with anybody. It's one thing Jesus doesn't share. It belongs to him. Don't touch God's glory. It's his. But because of our ego and because of our, uh, our sinful nature, we have an element of saying, hey, I've got a little bit of glory myself. And that's what gets in the way between God's glory and you is your glory or your desire for glory or your desire for reputation or your desire to achieve and people to hey, throw a few accolades your way. Your desire for glory gets in the way of you finding the glory of God. Now, it's illustrated in this passage. Listen, this is so cool. Mary is a woman. She walked in the presence of men. In those days, the woman would have, walked, would have worn coverings on their hair. Because the hair was their glory. And they wouldn't share that glory with anybody other than their husband. That was, that was their glory. And so she takes off this headdress. She goes into Jesus. And the account of the same incident in the book of John, go and read it. I think it's John chapter 12. Go and read it. Is she not only just pours the ointment on Jesus, but she takes her hair, her glory, and she wipes his smelly feet with her glory to say, God, I'm going to give you my glory because I don't want anything in comparison to the glory that you are and that you have. People, you will know that you are a Mary when you're willing to sacrifice and take your glory and wipe it on the feet of Jesus. You say, Trevor, don't be so radical. I don't think I can be radical enough because that's what this is about radical discipleship. So anybody who thinks that they've got a measure of glory and that they should be somebody or something, take it and dump it at the feet of Jesus because it's all at the end of the day about, about him. So I ask you the question again, is Jesus worth it? Is he really? A disciple is someone who sees and responds to the worth of Christ. Mary with her hair. You know, you, you look at, at the, the beauty of what Jesus says to Mary now. He says this to the disciples. He says, what this woman has done today is going to be spoken of for many generations to come. It's something like, maybe like 2,000 years now, more than 2,000 years since this incident took place. And here we are, talking about the, the apparent extravagant sacrifice of, of Mary. Jesus was right. Mary's will be spoken about till the end of time, about the beauty of her willingness because of her love for Christ to do what she, what she did. Jesus said in John's account, in verse 3, it says that the house was filled with a sweet-smelling aroma. So you can imagine all of that nod in this little old house with just this crowd of smelly disciples, and she pours this on, and that sweet-smelling aroma <sighs> fills the entire house. Let me make an application here quickly. This house has an incredibly sweet-smelling aroma of people who have made sacrificial sacrifices too, and people who have lived like the Mary over here, I think of some of the heroes of our church. I can still smell the sweet smelling aroma of Anna Bradaseth, Nos Bradaseth, Lilius, Mike Hansen, Matt Lanigan, Nico. You smell the aroma. Of the not of their sacrifice, but of their love for Jesus. Their willingness to break all the barriers and love him like that. Is Jesus worth it? I think so. 
If we could talk to the martyrs today, those that have been martyred in the past, and many are still being martyred across the world right now. And we ask the martyrs and say, hey, guys, guys, you got martyred for Jesus. You were thrown to lions. You were crucified on crosses. You were burnt in oil. They, they, they hung you upside down and crucified you. Was it worth it? And with a beaming smile and a very quick response, I'm sure they say, of course it was worth it. And it was totally normal. We were sacrificed for that because we wanted to do that. We wanted to identify with the death of Jesus. We didn't run from that. Don't glorify us because of this apparent sacrifice. This for us was normal. You say, why? Because we knew who he was. And we know who he is. And when you understand that, no sacrifice will be too big. In fact, it won't be called a sacrifice at all. Their extent to their sacrifice was proportional to their value of Jesus. I'm kind of finished, but I've got two little points I want to make as I close. You know, on TV, there's a, a, a TV show that Helene really likes, and it's called The Antique Road Show. Have you watched that thing? So even you kids have watched it. Hey? Watched it. Antique Road Show, where people find stuff in their houses. And they, they think, well, this is so old. I wonder if it's worth anything. And they bring this thing to a bunch of experts, and the experts will analyze it and check it out. And they will place a value on something that up until now has had no value at all, just sentimental value, if anything. And some of these people are saying to the, these people who bring, bring this stuff to them, good night. Do you know what you're visiting? Do you know what you've been hanging on your wall here? Do you know what the value of that medal is? Do you know what the value? Good night, this putt that you've got here. Do you know this thing is worth 20,000 pounds? And I'm thinking, what, what, what? That thing has been sitting in my attic or sitting on the table, and it's actually getting in the way, and we, we just accumulate dust on the thing. And there are some people who have a relationship with Jesus like that. And I say with real reverence, you've got to take Jesus off and dust him every now and then to understand the value of what you have. If you have Jesus and he's accumulated some dust, you need to get rid of that stuff to begin to restore him to his true value, which is no value is high enough for who he is. So maybe there are believers here today who say, yeah, I know Jesus. I know him. But hey, he's accumulated a bit of dust. Get rid of the dust because of the value of who Jesus is. And a second example, similarly, is a parable that Jesus told, also about a treasure, about a man walking across a field. And he saw a treasure buried in the field. He was an honest man. He wasn't a thief. So he left the treasure there, probably covered it a bit, and he went off and it says he sold everything he had so he could have the treasure. He so wanted it. No price was too high. He sold the farm. He sold the car. He didn't sell his kids out anything, but he sold everything he had in order to have the treasure. Maybe today you're walking through the field of life and you come today and you hear me talk about the greatest treasure that could ever be is the treasure of knowing Jesus. And you're saying, Trevor, I want that. Man, I want that so bad. Well, you know what you have to do. You have to be willing to drop everything else, what people are going to say about you, what you think about yourself and about the church and about people. You're going to have to drop all of that if you want the treasure. And if there is anybody here like that today, Man, this would be a good day for you. Some of us have to dust off the treasure to remember what value we have in him, Jesus. Some of us may discover Jesus for the first time, and the principle applies. Get rid of it all so you can have him. How much is Jesus worth to you? I guess we all have to answer that question. Who he is to you will determine the depth of your worship for him. Who he is to you. There was a, a beautiful old man. His name was George Beverly Shea. Many of you in my generation would, would be familiar with his name. He was a friend of Billy Graham's. 
And uh, at all the Billy Graham crusades around the world, when Billy would preach, he would sing. And he wrote a song that epitomizes very much what I'm saying to you today. It's a song that I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than have wealth untold. And he says, I just want Jesus. It's not a sacrifice because I want him so badly. Nothing is a sacrifice. This is normal, normal because of who I want in him. So I've asked Lizzie, who sings this song so beautifully, I've heard her sing it before, just to come and sing this song. Just close your eyes, people, and think about how much worth is Jesus to you. Let's see what you think. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have great worth in us. Thank you that you love us. And I pray today, God, that each one of us would develop a greater passion for you simply because you are who you are, nothing else. That you are who you are, you love us the way you do, and we offer ourselves to you right now and pray that nothing, that silver or gold, will ever substitute for the wonder of who you are. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.